or working with a kind of model where each week we're exploring one of the turnings of the wheel of dharma and this is a teaching that comes out of the tibetan tradition it's called the three turnings um, i studied this at naropa with a really great um uh, professor named judith simmer brown and another professor named sarah harding and it was really interesting to learn about the way that the tibetans kind of conceived of the history of their own tradition and in the three turnings model the idea is that there had been these three periods of history um, starting with the Buddha, the historical Buddha, um, in which um, the teachings of Buddhist Dharma um, went through profound changes. Um, I would use the term like evolved um, or adapted or, or went through a kind of paradigmatic shift. And um, one of my mentors, Ken Wilbur, and several others you know, who are in the Dharma scene, now believe that we're going through something similar um, here and now that we're in a quote unquote fourth turning of the wheel um, with modernity and all of the sort of developments that are happening and um, you know that that we're in a very big shift with respect to how Buddhist Dharma is understood and practiced and I think that's probably true um, so from from the point of view of these different turnings we're each spending each week looking at it looking through a particular lens um, these different turnings of the wheel and in the first turning which we explored last week you know the idea with birth and death is that we're trying to in some ways transcend birth and death transcend the cycle of being reborn and and dying some what, what the early buddhists called samsara and, you know, this was the ideal in the early Buddhist tradition. You know, the idea was uh, if you woke up, if you became a fully enlightened person, what they called the arhat, that's the, I the ideal of, of the first turning, that when you die, you would just poof, you know, out. Um, they called that par para nirvana. Um, and so in a way, I was just thinking it's kind of funny that our current, you know, culture and kind of scientific materialist culture, we, we very much view death as that anyway, yet that when you die, you just kind of poof. So in a way, our culture uh, holds that everyone goes into para nirvana. So interesting just to see how the metaphysics have changed. Um, but in the second turning, there's a big shift, and this happened around first, second century CE, um, and especially with the teachings of a philosopher monk named Nagarjuna. And um, there's not a whole lot known about him as a person. Um, it sounds like he's a bit of a mythical character, but um, there are several really important works that date back to the time that are attributed to him. And uh, there were some pretty important shifts and changes in how Dharma was understood that became part of what this larger um, movement called the Mahayana, um, the great vehicle. And one of the interesting shifts is that the ideal of practice changes. It moves from what in the first turning was the arhat, you know, the, the perfectly enlightened person, to in the second turning, the bodhisattva. Uh, and, the, and the bodhisattva ideal of helping all beings wake up. And even more than that, not just helping all beings wake up, but putting off one's own awakening, putting off one's own para nirvana, so that one could continue to be reborn and be of service or be of benefit. Um, and so what, what part of what I think enabled that shift of not trying to escape is that there was also a kind of turn in the philosophy and probably also in the realization of that philosophy wherein there wasn't this duality or this split between nirvana and samsara held up anymore. In fact, in the Mahayana revolution, one of the big changes was the shift toward what we could call non-duality, that um, nirvana and samsara aren't separate. They're not apart from one, or one another. Samsara is nirvana. Nirvana is samsara. And there's a great uh, quote here that I'd like to share um, by the Zen teacher Dogen, uh, Dogen Zenji, um, where he puts it this way. 
just understand that birth and death is itself nirvana. There's nothing such as birth and death to be avoided. There's nothing such as nirvana to be sought. Only when you realize this are you free from birth and death. So here, this is a really big shift. Instead of seeing birth and death as the cause of suffering and as something we need to get out of into this liberated, unconditioned freedom that somehow stands apart from samsara, there is a shift towards seeing that samsara, all this that's happening, the suffering, the confusion, the difficulty, the joy, all of it is also that unconditioned state, which isn't a state. And that's part of why I think they started to see that these things didn't have to be apart because they're not actually, um, they're not both states. Uh, one of them is something that kind of goes beyond states. Um, as Bill Hamilton, one of my uh, Kenneth Folk's teachers said, you know, the only thing that you can say about Nirvana is that you can't say anything about it. So how could it be opposed to life or stand apart from it? So that was a big part of the shift that starts happening here. And, and another part of this shift is reconceptualizing um, the idea of emptiness and really bringing that idea on line more uh, of emptiness. And instead of sort of in the first turning, seeing emptiness in terms of the three characteristics of experience, impermanence, suffering, selflessness, um, and seeing um, emptiness as being there being a lack of a stable, solid entity. Uh, in the second turning, emptiness starts to become understood rather as interdependence, that actually everything depends on everything else. Everything is interconnected. Thus, there is no independent entity. There isn't something that stands apart from reality. Um, and this, this understanding of the interdependency of all of life, which did, was starting to become expressed in the first turning um, through, through the teachings of what are called codependent, codependent arising, um, paticca samuppada. Um, that got understood in a kind of more universal, broader scale, not just at the individual level, but everything is dependent on everything else. Everything is interdependently arising, is arising with everything else. And so we can't separate ourselves out. And this emptiness is that lack of separation, is that lack of independence. Um, and thus compassion in the second turning becomes a central idea. Um, that actually the point of the path is also to generate compassion because of this interconnectivity. Um, and um, compassion, uh, Shinzen Young uh, said, you know, uh, in the second turning, wisdom and compassion were put on equal footings. Whereas before, wisdom, uh, liberation, was seen as being higher than even the Brahma Viharas, you know, the uh, open heart teachings. Mm -hmm. So this is a huge shift. Um, it looks like historically and it changes, you know, how, how we might look at and approach birth and death.